Shalom, shalom, and praise the Lord. Once again, I'm glad to be given this chance and opportunity to testify about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, I want us to continue with part three of our topic, the kingdom of God and its fulfillment. And uh, before we pick from where we stopped, I want to do a very short recap and then we can continue from where we stopped. We started in Luke 11 and verse 2 when Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. I will just go straight to the point and he told them to say thy kingdom come, thy kingdom come. So the question was where exactly was the kingdom of God coming to? One thing we were sure about, one thing we were sure of is that Jesus was not talking about the kingdom of God coming on earth because he was already on earth as the kingdom of God. That means he was among and in their midst when he was teaching them. So what was he talking about when he taught them to pray and say, thy kingdom come? Now, Jesus, being fully God and fully man, knew very well that his will and plan for his first coming was to establish his kingdom, his kingdom, in the hearts of his seed, which had not yet happened because Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus was not yet glorified. There are two things in glorification of Jesus. One is his resurrection and number two is his ascension to heaven, to a higher position, to a higher place, to a higher authority and power. In Philippians 2, 8 to verse 9 says that being found says that being found uh, as a man being found in appearance as a man so Jesus was uh, found in appearance or uh, in appearance as a man he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even to the death of of the cross Therefore, because he stooped so low, so Jesus stooped so low, so that he can save man. And because he stooped so low, God highly exalted him to a higher position, place, authority, and power. And he was given him, and he was given a name that is above every name. So, he had to die first, be buried, resurrect, and ascend to heaven before reigning in the hearts of, in the hearts of men as a king. So when Jesus told them to say, thy kingdom come, he was talking about him dwelling and reigning in the hearts of those who believe trust and rely on him and have put their faith in him. His will and plan was fulfilled in the day of Pentecost. So that, uh, that will of, of, of him reigning in the hearts of men, it was fulfilled in the day of Pentecost. <coughs> Sorry. We also saw that that phrase, thy kingdom come, was, that phrase, thy kingdom come, has two aspects. Has two aspects. One of them is present, the second one, but I prefer to call it the last one, is future. Let us start, we started with the present aspect of the kingdom of God, which was fulfilled in the day of Pentecost after the ascension of Jesus Christ. That is when all people who believe in Jesus Christ began to be baptized with or of the Holy Spirit, which means the Holy Spirit started residing permanently in the hearts of men since the day of Pentecost. That is when King Jesus 
started reigning to reign in the hearts of his seed. When we say we are in the kingdom and the kingdom of God in us, what we refer to is the first aspect of the kingdom. What we refer to is the first aspect of the kingdom. This aspect is inherited by only believing and putting your faith in Jesus Christ as uh, in Jesus Christ and relying on the finished work of redemption that was done by him. The importance, the importance of receiving the first uh, aspect of the kingdom is that the first aspect is an assurance of the last aspect. If you miss the first aspect, then that means even the last aspect is not for you to inherit. So, no matter what, you must make sure that you inherit the first aspect of the kingdom of God because it has two aspects. So, I want us to pick from there and uh, so that we can continue and I hope we will be blessed together. So, I want us to continue looking at the importance of being in and receiving the first aspect of the kingdom of God. So, I want us to continue from there. Number one, I want, uh, I want uh, us to see the importance of receiving and being in the kingdom of God as the first aspect. Uh, one, it is in the first aspect of the kingdom we become children and sons of God. We, I mentioned that last time, but I want to go a little bit uh, deeper so that we can be uh, blessed together. So, in uh, first uh, in John one and verse twelve, I want to read. Uh, uh, using New King James Version, it says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right, the power, the authority, the privilege to become the children of God to those who believe in his name. Number 13, who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but the will of God. <coughs> Sorry. But the will of God. There are two things here. There are two things on uh, in this verse. There are two things here on how to become a child of God, to be born of God or to be born in the kingdom of God. One, the Bible says that as many as received him, the word receive means to accept or take something that has been offered or given to you. That means if Jesus is to be received, it means, it means that he is a gift that was given by God or from God to all men. So Jesus is a gift and that gift was given to all men by God himself because Jesus is all to be received. When the Bible says that as many as received him, as many as received him, to those he gave the power, the right, the privilege to, to become the sons of God. So the word received there, that means the word received it means to accept or take something that has been given or offered to you. And if Jesus is to be received, then it means that Jesus is a gift that was given to all men from by God himself. So Jesus... Jesus is gift is a Jesus is a gift and it is up to you and it is up to you to receive it accept it or reject it 
uh, or reject it because you have a will. You have a gift of will. So you can choose whether to accept it, whether to receive it or reject it. And that is up to you because you have a gift of will. You have a gift of will. But you have to know this. Rejecting Jesus Christ is rejecting the power that enables you, enables you or enables a person to become a child and son of God. In the kingdom of God, you don't become a son, but you grow to be a son. You grow to be a son as you are feeding in the word of God each and every day. And walking in obedience of that word of God, which is Christ Jesus, of course. You grow each and every day. So when you, when you believe in Christ Jesus, you don't become a son. You become a child of God. And then you have to give yourself to the word of God to uh, apply the word of God in your life so that you can grow each and every day as he continues to reveal his word to you. So we grow to be sons, but we become children of, uh, children of God when we receive Jesus Christ. And uh, Jesus, when we receive Jesus Christ. So, uh, in Colossians, in Colossians 2 and verse 19, says, uh, talks, uh, talks about how we grow with the growth that is from God. There are things in the kingdom, there are things in the kingdom you cannot inherit until you become a son. For example, authority. Children don't have authority, but, but sons do have. So there are things in the kingdom that you have, you can only get them when you mature to be a son. So you must make sure that you give yourself to the word of God so that you can grow each and every day to become a son of God so that you can learn to exercise the authority that you've been given, that has been given to you. So, children don't have authority, but sons do have authority. So, number two of how you, you can become a child of God or how we become children of God in the kingdom or how we are born in the kingdom of God. It is believing in his name. Believing in his name means to believe. Uh, to believe is that means to believe that indeed he is the son. To believe in his name means to believe indeed that he is the son of God. That he is the son of God. Let me say this again. The second aspect of, uh, of becoming the child of God is believing that uh, believing in his name and believing in his name it means uh, you believe that he is the son of god the savior of the whole world the only way to eternal life the only way to eternal life to believe in jesus christ is to believe that he died for your sins and he was buried so that he can take away all your sins in so that he can take away all your sins in a solitary place he was buried he took away your sins and he was buried so that he can uh, take away all your sins in a solitary in a solitary place because he is the real god of azazel he did that so that sin can be separated with his seed and his seed be separated completely with sin and uh, in the third day he was raised from the dead so that he can uh, so that he can receive uh, so that we can receive a justification as a gift by only putting our faith uh, 
in him. So he, he was raised in the that day. So that when we put our faith on him, we can receive a justification as a gift. Hallelujah. To believe in Jesus Christ is to believe and confess that he is Lord and you walk in total obedience of his Lordship. To believe in Jesus Christ is to believe that he is fully God and he is fully man. That he is fully man, that is the Son, and he is fully God, that is our eternal Father, our eternal Father, the definition of the word believe is to trust in, rely on, and to cling to Jesus. Hallelujah. That is how a person, that is how a person uh, is born, uh, that is how a person becomes a child of the kingdom. In King James Version, I want us to read in Galatians 3 and verse 26. Galatians 3 and verse 26. It says, For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So you are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. When it says we are children of God in Christ Jesus by faith, it means in the kingdom of God, it is where we can become the children of God. So in the kingdom, when it says in Christ Jesus, we are all children of God. It means in the kingdom of God. This is the first aspect of the kingdom. So it is in the first aspect in the kingdom of the kingdom we become the child the children of God. We become the children of God when we receive the first aspect of the kingdom. And that our uh, kingdom is Jesus Christ. So when we receive and believe in him, that is only when we can become the children we can become the children of God. I want us to go in Romans 8, 16. I want uh, 16 to 17. Uh, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. In verse 17, and if children then thin hairs, hairs of God and co hairs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. The Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we are truly, without any doubt, children of God. We are indeed the children of God. So it is the it is the spirit of God that bears witness along or with our spirit that we are truly with 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 no doubt the children of God. And then verse 17 says verse 17 says and if children then we are now heirs, heirs of God. If indeed we are children of God, then that means we are heirs, heirs of God. That means we have now qualified to inherit from our heavenly father by being born in the kingdom and uh, by, by being born in the kingdom and uh, we are co-heirs with Christ Jesus. So it is because of being born in the kingdom that made us qualify to inherit our father, to inherit 
uh, our father, our heavenly father, because now we are children of God. That is why the Bible says, and if children, then heirs, and heirs of God, and call heirs with Jesus Christ. That means everything that was given and committed in the hands of Jesus Christ, it is ours too. It is ours too, because we are coheres with him. We share everything, not in half, but we share in full. We share everything with Jesus Christ. We share each and everything that was given to him, because we are coheres with Christ Jesus. We are coheres with Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. I want us to read in John 3 and verse 34 to 35. I want us to go in John, in John 3, 34 to 35. The Bible says, I'm using New King James Version, says, for he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God does not give the Spirit by measure. 35. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hands. Hallelujah. It is uh, talking about Jesus Christ. It is talking this verse 34 and uh, that, uh, 34 to 35 is talking about Jesus Christ who was given the spirit without measure. So Jesus was given the spirit without measure. So is he the only one who was given the spirit without measure? Of course no. Of course no. We also, because we are co-heirs with him, we have been given the spirit without measure because the Holy Spirit was a promise that was promised to all those who will believe in Christ Jesus. According to John 7, from 37 to 39. So Jesus was given the spirit without measure, but he was not the only one who was given the spirit without measure. But we also, as he, as the children of God, we've been given the spirit without measure. Why? Because we are co-heirs with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we are co-heirs with Jesus Christ. We are co-heirs with Jesus Christ. That is very glorious. Now, I want us to go in Galatians, to read in Galatians 3, verse 13, 3, 13, and verse 14, says, Christ redeemed us says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. So Jesus Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. And verse 14 says that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might, now listen to this, that we might receive the promise of the Holy Spirit through faith, that we might receive the promise of the Holy Spirit through faith. So the Holy Spirit, so the Holy Spirit was a promise that was promised to all those who will believe in Christ Jesus. So that promise has already been fulfilled to all those who believe in Jesus, believe Jesus, believe in Jesus Christ. Believe in Jesus Christ. So 
they have been filled with the Spirit of God. And it is a spirit without measure so that we can be enabled to live a life that is in accordance with the standard of God. So we were given also the Spirit the spirit without measure because we are co-heirs with Christ Jesus so that we can be empowered. We can be enabled to live a life that is in accordance with the standard of God. Now listen, if Jesus lived a life that is free from sin, that means it is also possible for us to live the same life, to live the same life of Christ Jesus because we, we've now been uh, uh, given the power that enables us to do so. That power is a spirit without measure that we inherited, that we've inherited from our Father, we've inherited from God, our Father. That is why in uh, Romans 8, 12, Romans 8, 12 and verse 13, New King James Version it says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. Verse 13. For if you live after the flesh, you will die. But if you live, but if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the, the body, you shall live. It says, therefore, therefore, brethren, that means the audience are believers. The audience are believers. Children of God, people who are already born into the kingdom of God. So these people are already born into the kingdom. They are children of God. He says, we are debtors not to the flesh, not to the flesh. So that means that we don't owe the flesh anything because we are not debtors of the flesh, that we walk after the flesh. To live after the flesh, that means anyone who lives after the flesh according to the flesh is a sign, that is a sign that you are still a debtor of the flesh. And if you are still a debtor of the flesh, it means two things. One, it's either you are, net, you are not genuinely saved or not yet in the kingdom. And number two, you just want to grieve the Holy Spirit. When you live after the flesh, it is a sign, it is a sign that you are not yet in the kingdom of God. You are not genuinely saved. You are not genuinely born of God. And number two, you just want to grieve the Holy Spirit. He goes on to say, he goes on to say that, uh, he goes on to show the repercussion of walking after the flesh. The repercussion of walking after the flesh, walking according to the flesh. The repercussion is eternal death. When we say, when, uh, when he says, you shall die. He is not talking about the physical death. He is talking about the eternal death. That means you will be cut off. You will be cut off because you lacked fruit transformation. You lacked fruit, which is transformation. Transformation is conforming to the life of Christ Jesus. If you lack, if you lack this fruit, if you lack, 
this fruit, it means you will not live eternally with Christ. You will not live eternally with Christ. Why? Because you lacked the fruit, the fruit of transformation, which is conforming to the life of Jesus Christ. That is why he says, you mortify, you must mortify the deeds of the flesh. You shall live. If you mortify the deeds of the flesh, you shall live. But if you fail to mortify the deeds of the flesh, with the power that you've been given of the Holy Spirit without measure that you've been given, you shall not live. You will die eternally because he knows, God knows very well that he has already given you his spirit, his, his spirit without measure to enable you to mortify the deeds of the flesh. So we must mortify the deeds of the flesh in this aspect of the kingdom, in this aspect of the kingdom of God, the first aspect, we are expected by God to live a life that is pure, a life that is, that is in accordance to his standard, a life of Christ Jesus. We must mortify the deeds of the flesh because in this first aspect, God knows very well that he has given us the power that enables a person to mortify the deeds of the flesh. And that power is the spirit of God, the spirit that we've been given, the spirit without measure, the spirit without measure. So it is expected of us to live a life that is in accordance with that of Jesus Christ. We must live that life. If we fail to live that life, if we fail to mortify the deeds of the flesh. The Bible says those who walk after the flesh, after the flesh, it is an evidence that those people, they are debtors of the flesh. And if they are debtors of the flesh, it means that they are not genuinely saved. They are not born in the kingdom of God or they just want to grieve the Holy Spirit. They just want to grieve the Holy Spirit and the repercussion, the repercussion of living after the flesh, living in accordance of the flesh is eternal death. And these are believers. These are people who are already born of the born of God. This is referring to them. So we must keep each and every day walking in obedience, walking in obedience to the word of God. Hallelujah. This is the truth that many don't want to hear. They just want to be told what they want to hear. They want to be comforted in sin, the deeds of the flesh, they want to be told that no matter what you do, no matter how you live, you will still live eternally with Christ Jesus even after his visible second coming. He is a merciful God. This is what the people want to hear. This is what they want to be told and that he is a merciful God and a loving God and he will not throw anyone. He will not throw anyone to the lake of fire. But that is deception. God knows that he has given you the power, the power which is the Holy Spirit without measure to always, to always enable you to modify, uh, to modify, to modify the deeds of the flesh. So whenever 
a believer walks in the deeds of the flesh, he or she gr grieves the Holy Spirit. Remember, the Bible says in Ephesians that we should not grieve the Holy Spirit. And whenever he or she walks in the deeds of the flesh, he grieves the Holy Spirit. Spirit, oh my God, because God knows He has given us already the power that will enable us to mortify the deeds of the flesh for as long as we live in this house called the flesh, in this house called the body. We have the power, and the power is the Spirit of God without measure. Hallelujah. The Spirit of God without measure. That is the truth that many don't want to hear. That is the truth that many don't want to hear. They just want to be comforted in sin, in the deeds of the flesh. But what I will not do is to lie to you or comfort anyone who is leading to hellfire because it is very hot. It is very hot. It is uh, still very hot. Oh my God. We have to use that power. We have to use that power. Whenever you fail to use that power, the Holy Spirit, to mortify the deeds of the flesh, you grieve the Holy Spirit. You grieve the Holy Spirit. Now, I want us to read in... Uh, John 15, 1 to 6, so that we can uh, see or hear what Jesus said in John 15 and verse 1 to 6. In John, the Bible says, in, uh, I'm using New King James Version, I am the vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. That it may bear more fruit. The, the verse 3 says, You are already clean. Because of the word which I have spoken to you. Which I have spoken to you. Now, so Jesus is the true vine. That is what he says. Jesus is the true vine. And the father is the vine dresser. In verse 5, he says, we are the branches. Believers are the branches. Now we go back in verse 2. He says that every branch, that means every believer in him, every believer in him that does not bear fruit will be taken away, which means will be cut off. Every believer in him that does not bear fruit. So that means there are people, the believers who are in Christ Jesus, who are born of God, who are children of God, but they don't bear fruit. They don't bear fruit. They are fruitless. That means they don't have transformation. They lack transformation and conformation to the life of Jesus Christ. So, Jesus said that every believer in him, every believer in him that lacks fruit, that lacks transformation, because Jesus is talking about the fruit of transformation. He's talking about the fruit of transformation. So, they are people in him, believers in him, but they lack but they lack fruit. Which fruit is Jesus talking about again? It is a fruit of transformation and conformation to the life 
of the true vine that carries us. The true vine that carries us. You cannot be carried by a vine and live a life that is different from that, uh, from that of a vine. So if Jesus Christ is a, a true vine, and he is the one who carries us as branches. Then we must conform to the life of a true vine. And that is the fruit that Jesus is talking about here. And he says, every believer, every believer, whether you are born of God, whether you are a child of God, if you are in him, that is an evidence that shows that they are people who are in Christ Jesus, but they lack this uh, fruit. They lack transformation. They lack transformation. Why? Because they love the world too much more than they love Jesus Christ. So they lack transformation. They have failed to uh, give themselves to the word of God so that they can, they can, uh, they can uh, apply the word of God in their life so that they can be transformed and conformed to the life of a true vine, which is Jesus Christ. So you cannot be carried by a true vine, which is Jesus, and live a life that is so different from that of a true vine. It is impossible. That means you, if you are, uh, if you cannot transform, if you don't want to conform to the life of a true vine, which is Jesus Christ, it means you are not genuine. You are not genuine, but you are a force, a false believer. Oh my God. It is very, very, it is very good to be careful and always to open our eyes so that we can know those who are true in the kingdom. So that we can know those who are true in the kingdom of God. So we are expected to live a life that is a, that is a life of transformation and conformation to the life of a true vine that carries us. That carries us. Remember, in Romans 11, the Bible says that it is not us who carry the vine, but it is a vine which carries us. So the vine carries us. The vine is Jesus Christ. And the vine dresser is God. Whoever, whoever that does not transform, conform to the life of a true vine, the Bible says, Jesus said, that person will be cut off. They will be thrown away. They will be cut off. Oh my God. They will be cut off. Jesus continues to say that every branch that bears fruit, that bears fruit, this is verse 2, that bears fruit, he prunes. The original Greek word for prune is cleanse. So it means that he cleanses those who, those who bear fruit. He cleanses so that they can be able to bear much fruit. That means to continue, he continues to cleanse them each and every day. Each and every day. And how does he continue to cleanse them? How does he continue to cleanse, to cleanse them? In verse 3 he says, he says, you are already clean because of the word, because of the word which I have spoken to you, because of the word which I have spoken to you. So he uses his word that he continues to reveal to them or to us each and every day. So that is how he cleanses us each and every day by revealing and continuing revealing his word which is Jesus Christ to us. 
So as he reveals the word to us and we apply the word, we apply the word in our lives, that is how we continue to be cleansed each and every day by our Father, by our Father. So he continues, he continues to cleanse us more and more so that the, uh, so that we can be transformed and conformed to the life of a true vine, which is Jesus Christ, so that we can continue to be transformed, we uh, to be transformed and conformed to the life of a true vine, which is Jesus Christ. I want us to, uh, I want uh, us to read in uh, John. 17 and verse 17, New King James Version. Jesus said, Sanctify them. This is Jesus said, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is the truth. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is, uh, is the truth. So, how does God continue to uh, cleanse us? each and every day to sanctify us each and every day remember we are already sanctified we are already sanctified in Christ Jesus because that was a gift that we were given by our father so it is a gift that we were given by him it is a gift that we were given by him so he says uh, that he continues to sanctify us by his word. We are sanctified and he continues to sanctify us with his word. Continue to sanctify us with his word. That is why Jesus said, Jesus said, sanctify them by your truth, your word is uh, the truth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And uh, in verse 5, in verse 5, Jesus says, he says, he who abides in me and I in him, he who abides in me, Jesus sanctify them. Sorry. Now, he says this, he who, in verse 5, he who, he says, he who abides in me and I in him, that means, that means, whoever is in the kingdom and the kingdom of God in him, that is why Jesus said he who is a, who he who abides in me and I in him. That means whoever is in the kingdom and the kingdom of God in him bears much fruit. Bears much fruit. So each and every day they continue to be transformed, to be conformed to his life by the word of God which he reveals to us, which he reveals to them. Hallelujah. Which he reveals to them. In verse 6 he says that every believer who will be cut off, every believer that will be cut off, said that is that uh, every believer that will be cut off in verse 6. He says that every believer that will be cut off because of lacking fruit, because of not bearing this fruit of transformation and conforming to the life of a true vine, which is Jesus Christ. He says, uh, he says uh, that they will be thrown into the lake of fire. That is the second death, which is eternal. Similar to what Brother Paul says in Romans 8 and verse 
13. Romans 8 and verse 13. That is their destination. Jesus said, that is, that is, that is, that, Jesus said that, that fruit, that fruit is what glorifies God. Is what glorifies God. It is that kind of fruit that glorifies the Father and those who bear it. They are his disciples. They are his, uh, they are his disciples. That is the only way you can know. You can know that genuine, that the genuine disciple of Jesus Christ, the genuine disciple of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. How? By bearing, by bearing the fruit, by bearing the fruit, which fruit? The fruit of transformation and conformation to the life of a true vine, which is Jesus Christ. So no matter what you do, if you don't have this fruit, no matter what you do, if you don't have this fruit of transformation and conformation to the life of Jesus Christ, you cannot glorify the Father. It's the only fruit that draws, that is only fruit that draws genuine people in the kingdom of God. So without this fruit, no matter what you do, no matter what you do, without this fruit of transformation, conformation to the life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is a true vine, without that fruit, you cannot glorify God. You cannot glorify God. And it is the only fruit that draws genuine, genuine people in the kingdom of of God in the kingdom of God oh my God transformation now listen to this transformation is the only fruit that cannot be faked all other fruits can be faked but transformation is the only fruit that cannot be faked and the only fruit that shows a person is truly born of God or born in the kingdom. The other fruits, like being compassionate, giving alms to the poor, can be done by anyone, even those who are in the kingdom of darkness. That can be done by anyone. Being compassionate, giving alms to the poor, that can be done by anyone, even those who are in the kingdom of darkness. So if you measure a born again person by those things, by those things, com being compassionate, giving alms to the poor, if that is your way uh, of measuring, a born again person, a person who is truly born of uh, born of God, uh, born in the kingdom, then you will live to be deceived in your entire life. You will live to be deceived in your entire life because that way of measuring a born again person is very weak. That can be done by any person. Giving arms to the people, being compassionate, can be done by non-believers, can be done by pagans, can be done by people in the law, but can be done by, pe by people who are in the kingdom of darkness. So, we have been given... And, and, and inherited, been given, inherited the spirit without measure to enable us to live a life that is conformed to the life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That is very glorious. When you know that, what you do 
is that you worship God, you glorify his name, eat and every day because of that gift because we now we are co-heirs with Jesus Christ and that means we've already been given the spirit without measure because we are co-heirs with we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Jesus Christ and co-heirs with Jesus Christ now i want us to go back I want us to go back in uh, John 3 and verse 35 so that we can continue. In verse 34, we've seen that we were given the spirit without measure. So Jesus is not the only one who was given by, the, by, by Father, our Heavenly Father, the spirit without measure. But we've seen because we are coheres with him, we have the spirit without we have the same spirit without measure that is why that is why we are expected in this first aspect of the kingdom of god to live a life that is free from sin a life that is a, a life of transformation and conformation to the true vine which is jesus christ and now i want us to go in verse 35 in verse 35 new king james version new king james version let me read it says the father loves the son the father loves the son and has given all things all things underline the word all things the whole so the father loves the son and has given the whole all things into his hand this is talking about jesus christ how the father poured all of himself into him and trusted placed, committed everything into his hand because of his love to him, because of his love to him. And in John 17 and verse 23, Jesus said, in, uh, Jesus said, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you sent me, listen to this, and have loved them, and have loved them as you have loved me, and you have loved them as you loved me. So the same love has been poured into our hearts, the hearts of genuine believers. Now you can see what it means to be co heirs with Christ Jesus. We have the same spirit without measure, and the Father has poured his unconditional love to us. That means everything that was entrusted and placed in the hand of Jesus, everything that was placed and trusted in the hand of Jesus Christ has also been committed to us, to, to us, as his children and co heirs with Jesus Christ. Wow, let me say this again. Let me say this again. So, our Father has poured the same, same love he has poured into our hearts the same love and we've been given the spirit without measure so that means when the bible says that the father loves the son and has given all things and trusted committed all things to his into his hand that means even to us, he has committed the same, same things in 
to us. Why? Because we are co-heirs with Jesus Christ. So he has also been committed. He has also been committed to us as his children and co-heirs with Christ Jesus. All things. And the Bible says all. All things. All things. All things that is of God. My God, that is very, very powerful. That means you cannot ignore Jesus Christ. You cannot ignore Jesus Christ and go to the Father direct thinking that you can have anything without Him. What you need to know is that everything that is of God, that is of God, was given and trusted and placed in his hand. So he was given everything. So anything, anything that is of God was given to him. And to get it, you must go through him. That there is no other way that there is no other way. There is no other way. That is why verse 36 says, verse 36 says, New King James Version, there is no other way to get whatever that is of God. You have, you have to get it. You have to get it through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and everything that was uh, uh, entrusted and uh, placed in uh, his hand it is also it is also committed to us why because we are called heirs with uh, Jesus Christ so everything has uh, already been committed to us and uh, to get it anyone to get it have to go has to go through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you cannot ignore Jesus and go direct to the Father, go direct to God, thinking that you can have anything. You cannot ignore Christ Jesus because anything and because everything that is of God was given to Him because He is the only way of getting whatever is of God. That is why in verse 36 says, He who believes in the Son, that means to have faith in, rely on, cling to Jesus Christ. That is going through him to believe in Jesus Christ, to rely, to cling to Jesus Christ. So, to believe in Him, it is going, it is going through Him. It is going through Jesus Christ. So, it says, who, he, uh, it says, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, that is eternal life, has everlasting life, not, not, not will have, but it says, has already obtained the eternal life. And being saved from the wrath of God. Being saved from the wrath of God. It is the same as everything. So, now listen. Sorry. Now listen to this. Let me say this again. Let me say this again. The Bible says, He who believes in the Son, that means to have faith in, to rely on, to cling on, to cling to Jesus Christ, that is going through Him. That whoever believes in him has 
everlasting life, that means eternal life. And it does not say that we'll have eternal life, but it says already have obtained the eternal life. This eternal life, this eternal life, and being saved from the wrath of God is some, is some of everything that have been mentioned in verse 34. When the Bible says that the Father loves the Son and has given, has entrusted, has committed everything into his hands. And we've seen that everything has, commi has been committed to us too. So when verse 36 says that whoever believes have put their faith in Jesus have already obtained the eternal life and, uh, the, and uh, they have been saved from the wrath of God. Those are some of the, those are some of everything that is mentioned in verse 34. So those are some of everything that has been committed to us that is mentioned in that is mentioned in verse 4 through our Lord Jesus Christ. They, that, they, everything has been committed to us. Hallelujah. Everything has been committed to us through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Everything that includes eternal life and being saved from the wrath of God. And the Bible says that we have now obtained the eternal life. The eternal life, not will have the eternal life, but we have already obtained the eternal life because everything has been committed and trusted to us because we are co-heirs with Christ Jesus. We are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ Jesus. Now, maybe what we need to know here is eternal life has two aspects. One of them is present. The other one is future. Let me say this again. Eternal life has two aspects. One of them is present. The other one is future. Is future awaiting for the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is eternal life for the body. That is the, uh, the eternal, the aspect of eternal life, the future aspect of eternal life. It is a life of the body, the eternal life for the body. So that one is waiting for the second coming, the visible second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But because we are talking about the present, the present aspect of the kingdom of God, so let me, uh, let me, Concentrate with the uh, first aspect and present aspect of eternal life, of eternal life. So, so when the Bible says that we have already obtained eternal life, it is referring to the first aspect, which is present and it is eternal life. For the Spirit. When the Bible says that we've already obtained, we have already eternal life, it is referring, it is referring to the first aspect of eternal life, the first aspect of eternal life, which we obtained, which is obtained in the first aspect of the kingdom. So we've already obtained it. It is talking about the eternal life of the Spirit, which already we have obtained, uh, we, we've already obtained in this first aspect of the kingdom. So the first, in the first aspect of the kingdom, we obtain the first aspect of eternal life, which is the life, the eternal life 
of the spirit or the eternal life for the spirit which is an assurance which is an assurance of the other half so we are, we already have eternal life of the spirit we are waiting for eternal life for the body so this eternal life for the spirit which we now have which we have already obtained is an assurance of the other half which we will have after the visible second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It means we have already been given all aspects, but the eternal life for the body is waiting for the appointed time. It is ours. It is ours because we have an assurance. It is ours, but it is waiting for appointed for the appointed time for appointed time hallelujah for appointed time so whenever we talk about the eternal life we've already obtained the eternal life you have to know it is the first aspect of eternal life which is the eternal life of the spirit the eternal life for the spirit that one we've already obtained and it is an assurance of the other half. The other half is eternal life for the body. The eternal life for the body which is awaiting that promise is awaiting for the visible second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For the visible second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, hallelujah. For oh, the visible second coming. Now, I want us to, I want you to listen to this. Listen to this. It says in verse 36, And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life. That is John 3 and verse 36 says, And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. When the Bible says, Whoever does not believe will not see life, it means they will not spend eternity with God where there is no sorrow, where there is no pain, where there is no more crying, but rather they will face the wrath of God because they rejected the only one who takes away the wrath of God. They rejected him. They rejected the one who takes away the wrath of God, the, which is Jesus Christ. So whoever does not believe, have faith in, rely on, cling, on, cling to, Jesus Christ will not see life, which means they will not spend eternity eternity with God, with God, where there is no sorrow, where there is no pain, where there is no more crying, but rather they will face the wrath of God because they rejected the one who takes away, who took away the wrath of God. In Romans 2 and verse 8, the Bible says in Romans 2, in Romans 2 and verse uh, 8, the Bible says, But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, they will receive indignation and wrath. So that is the repercussion. That is their payment. All those who do not believe in Jesus Christ, all those who do not believe in Jesus Christ, all those who do not obey Jesus, they will not spend 
eternity with God. They will not spend eternity with God. But listen to this. To believe, to believe means to have faith in, rely on, cling to Jesus and continue in obedience towards Jesus Christ. That applies even to believers. That applies even to believers. So after believing in Jesus Christ, after putting our faith in Jesus Christ, we must continue uh, walking in total obedience. We must, we must continue walking in total obedience. And that is the word believe. So the word believe, the word believe, the word believe, goes hand in hand with the obedience, the total obedience, the total obedience to the word of God, the total obedience to the word of God. We must continue to walk in total obedience towards our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We must continue to walk in total obedience. Now listen, in these first aspects of the kingdom, we are expected to walk in total obedience to the, uh, towards the word of God, which is uh, Jesus Christ. Denying ourselves completely, carrying our cross daily, which means to crucify our bodies, its, its, its passions, lusts, desires and serve the purpose of God in our lives faithfully and we've been given everything to enable us to live that kind of life that kind of life if we don't if we don't live that kind of life then there is no difference between us and pagans. There is no difference between us and non-believers. There is no difference between us and pagans. There is no difference. There is no difference. And uh, we, and we cannot spend eternity with God because God knows very well. He gave us already. He gave us everything to enable us uh, he gave us everything to enable us to live that kind of life, a life of transformation to the conformation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We must be transformed and conformed to the life of a true vine, which is Jesus Christ. But because, but because of the love of the world, and lack of endurance, many, some might, uh, might not make it, might not make it. So we have to love God more than anything, more than anything. We have to keep on mortifying the deeds of our flesh. We have to keep on mortifying the deeds of our flesh because in this first aspect of the kingdom of God it is expected of us to keep on mortifying the deeds of the flesh because we've been given the spirit of God without measure so we've seen we've seen that we are children of God and uh, the, what qualifies us to inherit from our Father is first becoming the children of God. And uh, we've seen that by receiving and believing in Jesus Christ, now we are children of God and the Spirit of God himself bears witness uh, with our spirit that we are indeed, we are truly the sons and the children of God. And if children then heirs and heirs of God and coheres with Jesus Christ, with Jesus Christ and uh, being coheres, 
big core hairs mint, means joint hairs joint hairs we share everything in full everything that was committed and trusted placed in the hands of God, the hands of Jesus Christ, it is ours too. It has already been committed to us too. And we've seen first, it is the Holy Spirit without measure. He was given the Spirit without measure that, uh, that goes to us too. Because we are co heirs with Jesus Christ, we have the Spirit without measure. We've seen also that the Father has poured his love to us, has poured his love to us because the Bible has said that the Father loves the Son and has put everything into his hand, has committed everything into his hand because of love. The same, same love has been poured into our, into our hearts the same same love so we've inherited the spirit without measure we, we've, we've inherited the uh, love of god and also everything everything that includes every other thing that is considered to be of god in uh, our next teaching we will continue to see the the, the the things that has already been given and committed to us uh, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Hallelujah! Thank you very much for this uh, opportunity and your appearance. I thank God.